I want to mention that I'm using the words estate and estate planning over and over again today. So you're probably thinking, what is my estate? Well, my estate consists of my money and my investments, my life insurance, any home or real estate that I own, my personal property, such as my jewelry, furnishings, furniture, collectibles, and the like, my family, and my values. Your probate estate consists of assets that are in your own name that don't pass by a beneficiary designation or by operation of law, such as if you own something as joint tenants as husband and wife or with somebody else. These assets typically bypass probate and go directly to the named person or charity. Your taxable estate not only consists of your probate estate, but it also consists of all your other assets, including your retirement accounts and anything that passes jointly or outside of probate. So your estate consists of all of the above. Assets that pass directly by a beneficiary designation or through joint tenancy are not protected from creditors or predators or the beneficiaries themselves. So I'll show you that doing that is not adequate estate planning. And of course, your estate consists of your legacy and the values that you want to pass to your family and your heirs. So here's some famous people that did not do a good job in their estate planning. You can see Jimi Hendrix in the upper left-hand corner and below him is Prince, Aretha Franklin, Sonny Bono, who became a U.S. congressman after he was a rock star, James Gandolfini from Sopranos fame, Heath Ledger, who was best known for his uh, portrayal of uh, the Joker in The Dark Knight, Kobe Bryant, and Robin Williams. Jimi Hendrix died without a will, and his estate is still tied up in court even though he died over 50 years ago. Can you believe that? And Prince died more recently also without a will, with an estate estimated at over $500 million. James Gandolfini failed to do any tax planning, so his situation is bollocks up. And Kobe Bryant's lawyer forgot to draft his trust to enable his youngest child to be included as an heir. They had to go to court to resolve the issue, spent probably $100,000 unnecessarily. So everyone on this call knows at least one of these celebrities. But estate planning is not just for celebrities or the wealthy. It's for everyone who owns a home, a car, cash, a bank account, who's got life insurance, or any other type of property or investments, including retirement accounts like an IRA or government retirement. Part of your estate planning includes having a will, which tells the court and your heirs who is in charge of gathering your wealth and paying your debts and taxes and how to disperse what's left. And the will also names guardians for your minor children or your dependents. Did you know that the American Bar Association estimates that over 70% of all Americans don't even have a will? So I mentioned probate. You might, you know, I think you're thinking in the back of your mind, I understand what you mean by estate now. Maybe not as much on estate planning, so I'll learn that today. But I heard you mention the word probate. What's probate? Well, basically, it's a process where after somebody becomes disabled or dies, the court in the county where that person lives has to administer the disabled or deceased person's assets. It involves filing papers with the court, having an attorney and CPA involved in those filings, paying them to be involved, and paying the commissioner of accounts in the county to review all of the filings. And you have to pay the commissioner of accounts fees to review all of those filings. Needless to say, the cost of going through this probate process can be very expensive. It also re results in delays in getting your wealth distributed in the manner in which you desire to the people you want to have it distributed to. There are two kinds of probate in Virginia, one called living probate, which is also known as conservatorship, and death probate. So being a minor is one form of disability where you have to go through living probate if they have any assets in their name. Another one is where somebody is mentally or physically incapacitated. Earlier in my career, my secretary was married and her husband left a share of his assets 
to his minor children after his untimely early death. He died of cancer in his 40s. They had just adopted a baby boy. The inheritance for the, ma- for the baby was managed in a living probate known as conservatorship. And my secretary had to file annual accountings with the county court for the investments held in her minor son's accounts until he reached the age of 18. That's 18 years worth of accountings. Then you have death probate. And again, death probate involves the court, the commissioner of accounts and the court in which you res- in the county in which you reside. It's lengthy, it can be six, nine months, or several years or many years to take to go through death probate. And of course, it's expensive. And I'm gonna tell you about two stories that will show you how probate can be a huge burden on your families and your loved ones, even if you have a will. So now you, you've got an idea of what probate is. Let's talk about the five biggest mistakes people make when they do or they don't do their estate planning. Number one, doing nothing. No will, no trust, no powers of attorney. You didn't even have any beneficiary designations on your retirement or your life insurance. No joint ownership, nothing. Well, doing nothing guarantees absolutely that you'll go through probate, and it gives control of how your assets are going to pass to the state of Virginia or the state in which you reside. I've told this story a bunch of times to my clients, but I'll tell it to you right now. There's a story of a doctor. He was accomplished, had significant wealth, who did absolutely no estate planning before he died. One February, he was flying in a snowstorm with his wife, three daughters, and the nanny, for a brief vacation in North Carolina. The plane crashed on approach to the airport, probably as a result of poor visibility. Everyone on board was killed. Unbeknownst to everybody, the doctor had fathered an illegitimate child with another woman. Because the doctor had no will and his natural heirs were all deceased, the illegitimate child who was next in line was the sole heir under the intestate statutes of his state of residence. The doctor's mother was living in the family home, which the doctor inherited when his father passed away. His mother was forced to move out, and the family home was held for the benefit of his illegitimate child. The estate, needless to say, was embroiled in litigation for years, and the family had to buy the home back so the mother could stay there and live there for the rest of her life. What a mess. Then there's Jimmy's story. No will, no heirs. Jimmy died about eight years ago without a will. He asked his best friend Cameron in an email to handle his affairs after he was gone. This left Cameron in a really difficult position. Because Jimmy didn't have a will, Cameron first had to file a petition with the court, and this was in Fairfax County, Virginia, to be allowed to serve as the administrator of Jimmy's estate. Because Cameron wasn't related to Jimmy, Cameron had to hire an attorney to help him convince the court that he could be permitted to handle Jimmy's affairs because his best friend asked him to. Cameron had to post a bond, a surety bond, for $5 million to be sure that he didn't run off with Jimmy's assets. And then Cameron had to figure out what Jimmy owned. When all was said and done, Cameron had discovered that Jimmy had squirreled away nearly $5 million in various bank accounts, securities accounts, and other assets spread across many firms around the country. Jimmy kept decent records, but Cameron's job was made much more difficult because even after he found all the assets, he didn't know what to do with them. And because Jimmy had no will, Cameron had to begin the complicated and very costly process of going through probate in an an intestate estate, meaning that Jimmy didn't have a will. Next, he had to figure out who the natural heirs were because Virginia law requires that. And so he had to hire an heir search company, not A-I-R, but H-E-I-R, heirs, his natural heirs. And the cost of that search was over $100,000. He finally was able to locate distant cousins who were descended from Jimmy's great-grandparents in Germany and Austria, 
and they inherited all $5 million of Jimmy's assets. He also had to pay a probate tax of around $5,000 in Fairfax County, and all counties in Virginia have the same probate tax. Within four months of being admit admitted as the administrator of the estate, that's what they call the person who's in charge of running the intestate estate, Cameron then had to file an inventory, and he went back and forth with the commissioner of accounts until he got it right, and the commissioner of accounts charged him fees for doing that. And then after the inventory was approved by the commissioner, he had to start submitting annual accountings to the commissioner, and every accounting had to be approved. Did you know that in Fairfax County and Loudoun County and all the local jurisdictions, that an accounting that you submit to the commissioner of accounts has to be reconciled to the penny. Every dollar, every penny that goes into the estate and gets paid out of the estate has to be backed up by bank statements, checks, and invoices. And if you don't do it exactly the way the commissioner demands, the commissioner sends back the accounting until you get it right. So, so Cameron had to submit four accountings just to get to the point where he was able to distribute the assets to these heirs over in Austria and Germany. And when he finally got through that, the commissioner of accounts kept hounding him and asking for more information. Finally, Cameron came to me and he said, can you expedite the resolution of this estate so I can get out of here and not have to deal with this any longer? What happened was he hired us. We still had to go through two more accountings. Finally, we got it done and we closed the estate eight years after Jimmy died. Long story short, probate is not for the faint of heart, and it requires significant patience, diligence, organization, and knowledge of the way in which the process works. And in order to get that knowledge, you shouldn't have to do it yourself. You're going to have to hire an attorney and a CPA to help you through it. And if you want to control where your assets go and save your families the delays and costs of probate, you should be thinking about doing a much more comprehensive and uh, successful plan involving a revocable living trust and all the documents that you need to have a successful plan to avoid having to put your heirs through what Cameron went through in Jimmy's estate. The second biggest mistake that people make is trying to do everything yourself. So, People think you're going to save money by doing it themselves. They'll use legal Zoom or Rocket Lawyer and they'll download documents and try to prepare their own documents. And I know it's going to save a lot of money, but it may not save a lot of money in the long run. Others try to amend their documents by writing changes in the margins of their wills or trusts that may have been drafted previously by a lawyer, thinking that this will be binding after they're gone. But they don't know the nuances of the law, and particularly in Virginia. I had a client who decided to change his trust by using handwritten notes on the trust that he had executed. The changes were not done in accordance with the laws of Virginia and were not binding on the trustee or the beneficiaries. So we had to go to court to seek guidance as to how to carry out the client's wishes. By thinking he was saving money by doing it himself, he ended up causing his heirs significant distress and additional costs that could have been avoided. Owning properly jointly is like trying to do your estate planning by yourself. Let me explain to you why. When you think you're being clever and you're doing your own estate planning, by titling your real estate or your bank accounts or investments jointly with a spouse or a child, you may be making a huge mistake. You may have heard this story, so forgive me if I've told it before, but dad decided to put his bank account that had about $100,000 and his investment account that had about $400,000 in joint name with his daughter, Jamie. Dad was a widower. His wife had died many years before, and he thought he was doing the right thing. But dad also had three children who he wanted to share in the wealth equally. So he told Jamie to make sure that she used the money to pay any outstanding debts and expenses after he died, and then take what was remaining and give it to her siblings in equal shares. Well, dad refused to hire an attorney to prepare a will or even a trust to meet his wishes. He trusted Jamie to do the right thing. Guess what happened after he died? 
he avoided probate for sure, since the assets automatically passed to Jamie on his death. But Jamie decided that she should keep the bank account and the investments. Hey, because dad, she thought that dad loved her the best and that she was taking care of dad in his last days. So she was entitled to keep the wealth. You know, dad and Jamie's story illustrates the fact that holding property jointly may create what are called unintended heirs. In this case, it was Jamie who cut out the other kids and the kids were intended heirs. Jamie was the unintended heir of all of the assets. And if the joint account holder predeceases you or dies after you, the account still may have to go through probate. Worse yet, the joint account holder could give away the account so his or her new spouse or new family gets all the assets. How have you protected the decedent's kids by doing that? And last, joint tenancy as a way of minimizing your estate planning may create gift and estate tax problems that you never anticipated. For example, if you take your house and put your kid's name on the deed, that's a gift and it has to be reported to the Internal Revenue Service on Form 709. And even though it may not be taxable, if you don't file the Form 709, the failure to do so may result in penalties and interest. Mistake number three, not protecting your family. Owning accounts and other property jointly is one way that you may not be protecting your family. I just illustrated that for you. But another way not to protect your family is to name somebody as the beneficiary on your bank account or your retirement account or your life insurance and just leave it at that. If you leave your assets outright to a surviving spouse, it sounds easy. It sounds great, but what happens if the spouse is not able to manage the money himself or herself? And what if the spouse remarries and puts a new spouse's name on the account or on the retirement assets? You may have created more unintended heirs of your wealth simply because the new spouse could use those assets to protect his or her family and not yours. What if the name of your spouse, what if you name your spouse as the sole beneficiary of your IRA or your retirement plan? That means your spouse can withdraw the assets at any time. They'll have to pay income tax on the withdrawal if it's not a Roth IRA, and they can use the funds for whatever they want. They could give the money away to charity. They could give their money away to their friends or a new family, or simply cut off your children or your other intended heirs. This is the problem of using beneficiary designations, which sounds eerily similar to the problems with joint tenancy. So it doesn't protect your spouse by using beneficiary designations and just naming your spouse. It doesn't protect and care for your minor children. It could cause unfortunate results. It may create unintended beneficiaries and it leaves you with no control over what happens if you do it that way. If you name a minor child as a contingent beneficiary of your retirement plan, it'll have to go through living probate. If you don't name a contingent beneficiary, it'll have to go through living probate or death probate. So think about it before you just try to skirt the, uh, the ideas that I'm going to tell you about in creating a comprehensive estate plan that will protect your family from probate as well as from themselves and creditors. Number four, mistake number four, having only a will. If you've got bank accounts and investments or real estate and all you have is a will and it's all in your own name and it doesn't pass by joint tenancy or beneficiary designations, guess what? The assets still will go through probate. Your jewelry, your bank accounts, your investment accounts, your real property, your cars, and other assets will be subject to an expensive and long probate process. Well, I'm going to tell you a story about Dale. This is a sad story, and it's a little bit long, so hang in there, because it illustrates a lot of things about not only just having a will may not be sufficient, but how you built your estate plan. Dale was an interesting guy. He was on his third marriage when he passed away at the age of 80. And his son, Bobby, came to me in a panic 
asking me to represent him against Dale's third wife, Anna, who apparently convinced Dale to change his will at the last minute and leave everything to her. Bobby was one of three children from Dale's first marriage, which ended in divorce over 20 years ago. Bobby told me that he had met with his dad before he passed away, and his dad told him that he would be provided under Dale's will. So when he asked Anna about the status of the estate, she told him, hey, Dale left everything to me and not to you. So when Bobby came to see me, needless to say, he was devastated. He knew that his father was ailing in his final days and was concerned that Anna had convinced Dale to change his will and leave everything to Anna. Anna had one child of her own from a prior marriage. Bobby also remembered that his dad had inherited a bunch of real estate in Ohio, Michigan, and California. And he was wondering what would become of these properties that had been passed down from Dale's ancestors through the family to Dale. He thought his father would provide in his will and that those properties would pass to the family members and not to Dale's third wife and her family. So, as you can see, this unfortunate situation raises a bunch of questions. Number one, was Dale even competent? Was he able to make decisions about his will when he executed the new will that named Anna as his sole heir? If not, Bobby asked me, can we challenge the validity of this will? Second question, was Anna entitled to the family properties? After all, it was passed from generation to generation. Everybody in the family had kept ownership of it until now. Did she exercise any undue influence? Was she taking advantage of Dale's frail state, even though he may have been competent, to convince him to cut out his family from these family properties? And number three, was the will drafted by and executed in front of a competent and experienced estate planning attorney and witnesses and a notary? And did the attorney have a chance to speak with Dale by himself without Anna being present in the room to dictate what the terms of the will would be? Did the attorney verify that Dale was competent to sign the will? Well, it turned out that the attorney who drafted the will was an old friend of Anna's and that Anna was present during the entire interview process and was, quote unquote, helping Dale answer all the questions that the attorney was raising. These facts gave Bobby enough ammunition to potentially challenge the will in court. We ended up settling the case out of court, which is good, because when you go to court, the only people who win are the lawyers and everybody else, their assets get drained off. It gave the siblings one half of the estate plus the family properties, and Anna got the rest. What could Dale have done differently? Well, the bottom line is, he could have created a revocable trust and placed all his assets and properties in that trust. Did you know that in addition to having to go through probate in Virginia, because he had real estate in Ohio, Michigan, and California, we had to hire lawyers in Ohio, Michigan, and California to go through probate in each of those three states. The cost of going through this after the litigation and everything was settled was ridiculously high. So, had Dale met with an attorney who was really independent at the front end, and had he involved Anna and his kids in the estate planning, things might have turned out very differently. A will is a document that, first of all, it doesn't cross state lines easily. You can't draft a will in California and expect it to work the same way in Virginia. And it's not effective until you die, so it doesn't help you if you, you become disabled. It doesn't protect against probate. I repeat, if you have a will and you have assets in your own name, it's not going to protect against probate and it may not protect your children. So if you put assets in joint name, a will doesn't override or govern the joint tenancy. The joint tenancy overrides the will. So think about that when you're only thinking about doing a will. And number five, the biggest mistake of all, is for those of you that have done estate planning with attorneys in the past, not updating your plan. A client came to me recently after 25 years. We signed their revocable trusts and wills and all their other estate plans a long time ago, before the millennium. 
At the time we did the original documents, the lifetime estate tax exemption was $600,000. Today, it's close to $13 million per person. So things changed from a tax perspective, but also when the original plan was drafted, one of his kids uh, was fine. After the plan was drafted, the child became disabled and started to have to rely on government benefits. They had grandchildren that were born. And the laws relating to trusts, wills, powers of attorney, health care in Virginia changed radically. And on top of all that, they told me they were going to move to Florida, which then, you know, led me to believe, hey, you need to update your estate planning. And you should have done it a long time ago. Did they need to update their planning? You bet they did. Lucky nothing happened to them that was adverse over the past 25 years. And a special note on powers of attorney and advanced medical directives. The power of attorney is over finances and it gives somebody the authority to act for you if you can't act for yourself on things that may be outside of your trust. It's important and it needs to be updated periodically and reviewed. The same goes for your advanced medical directive over health care. And you need a living will. It gives instructions on who's going to receive information about you, give information about you, and make decisions for you, particularly if you become uh, terminally ill or death is imminent and you're in a persistent vegetative state and you can't be cured. You need a living will. So I'll tell you the story of Cherry Chavo really quickly. Terry Chavo was a young woman who lived in Florida. And unfortunately, at the age of 25, she fell down, hit her head in her apartment, and became effectively a vegetable. She was in a vegetative state. They didn't know exactly where her brain was, but they believed that she could not hear, make decisions. She couldn't process anything cognitively. And so her husband, young husband, he was 26, tried to uh, exercise a right to terminate all life prolonging procedures. She was able to breathe on her own, but she wasn't able to swallow or drink on her own. So they intubated her and gave her nutrition and hydration through intubation. This went on for years. The husband tried to convince the hospital and the state to terminate all life prolonging procedures, including the nutrition and hydration, and they wouldn't terminate it. He hired lawyers. He went to court. And who was fighting it? It wasn't the hospital as much as it was Terry's parents, who were devout Roman Catholics. And under Vatican II, at the time, it prohibited the withdrawal of certain life-prolonging procedures, such as intubated nutrition and intubated hydration. So the parents were fighting her husband, who eventually went bankrupt. The parents continued to fight the hospital all the way to the Florida Supreme Court. They ultimately lost. But do you want your family to be in a situation like this without a living will? You've got to have a living will so that it makes your wishes known. You don't have to have it done according to the statute. I'll give you an example, hopefully, later on before we, t we, uh, we, we end this uh, webinar. You need to create your road to a successful plan. You need to avoid the five biggest mistakes. What is your plan going to look like? What can it look like? Well, my last big story I'm going to tell you about is Andrea's story. And this is a real story and it's a real success. Andrea found out that she had stage four pancreatic cancer and she wanted to make sure her affairs were in order before she passed. She came to visit uh, us with a, a complete file of her investments, her real estate deeds, her retirement assets, bank accounts, even a couple of annuities that she had recently purchased for, uh, for her lifetime that was sold to her by her investment advisor. And Andrea's husband had passed away recently. We, he actually had come to visit me, but he died the weekend after he came to visit me. So he didn't have an estate plan, but fortunately everything went to Andrea and she realized that she needed to do her estate planning. She had an estate that was worth about $3 million, including her house that was worth about $800,000 and no debt, no mortgage. 
She had adopted, she and her husband had adopted two children, a boy and a girl. The boy, Tate, was 35 years old and never was able to hold a steady job. But he was a good kid. And her daughter, Teresa, was 33, married with two children, and was gainfully employed, worked at a government contractor, had a good job, and was doing quite well on her own. And Andrea and her husband always had to support Tate and, uh, and, and Andrea wanted to make sure that Tate's share of any inheritance would be managed carefully for Tate's benefit. She knew he needed somebody to take care of him, but didn't want uh, Teresa to have to take care of Tate because she didn't want to put her into that awkward position. So she asked how she could do that. And I said, look, appoint an independent trustee, a third party who'd be willing to serve and watch over the assets as well as take care of Tate. That way Tate, Tate would be taken care of and couldn't pressure his sister into letting him spend the money on cars, women, and gambling, which he had a history of doing. Another advantage of Tate's trust, having an independent trustee, was that the assets could be preserved for Tate's needs for his lifetime, but still be protected from Tate and his creditors. Andrea also wanted to treat Teresa fairly, but didn't want to restrict her as much as she was going to restrict Tate. So Teresa's trust, she uh, had us draft, would continue for Teresa's lifetime, but Teresa served as her own trustee. Nobody was looking over her shoulder. This gave Teresa protection in the event that she got divorced, but not as much from her own creditors. She didn't need it because she was pretty prudent in how she lived her life. So we used a fully funded revocable trust, meaning that all the assets were put into the trust or designated to go to the trust. Upon Andrea's death, they were in the trust already before she died. So it held all of her assets and all of her properties. And she, Andrea, was the sole trustee with the ability to put assets in and take assets out at any time until she died or became incapacitated or disabled. And then after she passed, it contained a plan for Tate and Andrea. Andrea was also concerned about her declining health, so she named Teresa as her health care agent under her power of attorney or advanced medical directive. She outlined specific wishes that she wanted to have in case the pancreatic cancer got worse, including when she would stop all life-prolonging procedures because of her terminal condition. By the way, Andrea had two dogs, and her best friend offered to take care of the dogs if something happened to her. But we helped Andrea, in the same document, set up a pet trust that set aside some money so that the assets in that special pet trust could be used to take care of her dogs. And finally, Andrea gave us instructions to include in her notarized funeral instructions regarding her burial she wanted a green burial, which has become really popular recently. And she described the religious services that she wanted to be held following her death. She drafted a letter of instructions to her kids and her other advisors, indicating who was responsible for what tasks and how to get in touch with them. The prologue of the story is that Andrea passed a few months after we finished her documents. Tate's trustee was able to set him up in a nice apartment and encouraged him to work and provided him with assistance as he needed it. And Teresa kept her share in the trust and separate from her other assets. She used the assets to send her kids through college, ultimately, and pay for a few nice vacations while investing the assets wisely, continuing to use her mom's investment advisor. So a successful estate plan allows you to control your property during your lifetime, if you're healthy or you're not, and after you're gone. And it allows you to give the property to whomever you want when you want them to have it. It also allows you, allows you to build protections for your loved ones, including using a fully funded living trust and other estate planning documents that cover, cover health care and financial decisions. What do I mean by a fully funded living trust? It's like a packed suitcase for a trip that you're going to go on. 
In that suitcase, you're gonna put everything, things that you may need and things that you may not because you may not have anticipated everything that you need upon your disability or upon your death. It also is gonna hold all of your property and you don't wanna wait until the last minute to fund the trust, to put assets in the trust. You wanna do it now. And you wanna change the beneficiary designation so that your trust or another trust that you might use is the beneficiary of your life insurance or your retirement assets or even your bank accounts. So it makes it easier to pass the property to your heirs without having to go through probate, which I told you is expensive and causes delays. And again, you can put assets in your trust during your lifetime at any time and take them out without asking anyone for permission. So what does a fully funded basic estate plan, comprehensive estate plan look like? Well, it's got all of these documents. It's got a, tr a fully funded trust, the, the, the well-packed suitcase that we talked about. It's got a will that allows you to do what you want to do when you pass away. But the will shouldn't be the dominant document in your estate plan. It should be the trust. The will will govern the naming of guardians for your minor children or dependents. And it'll cover any assets that you forgot to put into your trust by pouring them over into your trust at your death. But again, it will not avoid probate. The third set of documents you need are healthcare powers of attorney and HIPAA releases. That is, who can see your medical records and who can make medical decisions for you. The living will, as I explained, is what to do if you're terminally ill or in a persistent vegetative state and there's no chance of recovery. Do you want all life prolonging procedures withheld? Do you want only some of them withheld? Do you want to provide, continue to provide intubated nutrition and hydration? Do you want your agent over health care to have to consent to the withholding of life prolonging procedures? Do you want more than one doctor? Maybe two, maybe three. Do you want to give your family enough time to come see you and say goodbye if you're in this state? The durable power of attorney over finances is who makes financial decisions for you if you can't make them for yourself on issues that are outside the trust, like what happens to your safe deposit box? What happens to your pets? What happens in the event that you're involved in a lawsuit? The agent under the power of attorney is going to make those decisions. An assignment of personal property is something that allows you to transfer all your jewelry, all your furnishings, all of your clothing, all of your collectibles, all of your antiques, everything that you own into your trust now before you die so that if you pass away or if you become disabled, we don't have to go through living or death probate. And of course, the notarized funeral instructions gives your family your wishes as to what you want to happen and doesn't allow a funeral director to unduly influence your family in a time of grief. It avoids conflicts after you pass. And an organ donor form is often very helpful for designating whether or not you want to donate your organs for transplantation and or research. On your driver's license in Virginia, it only provides for transplantation, not research. And some of our clients actually donate their bodies to medical schools for study. What is your story going to be? How will you define what your successful estate plan looks like? If we didn't answer your questions, Send your questions to myestateplan at zellaw.com, or if you already did, we will answer them, and we'll try to do so within uh, two business days. That's all I've got for you today. I really appreciate you investing your time and energy into this webinar, and it shows how committed you are to making sure your family and the people you care about are taken care of.